Hi everyone, my name is Chelsea. Welcome to Little Mountain Ranch. I am very happy to have you here with us today. We're just heading out to milk honey. So honey is one of my milk cows and she calved about a week ago, maybe a little over a week ago now. And today is going to be our first day milking her. So generally I like to wait about a week to two weeks, depending, before I start milking so that the calf can get all of that good colostrum and mom and calf can bond really well. So we like to start separating our calves from their moms at night when they're about two weeks old. So this gives them a really, really good solid start, but also starts them young enough on the halter and being separated that it's a little bit less stressful for them and for us. We didn't actually separate the calf from Honey last night because she's not, or he's not quite two weeks old yet. And for those of you that haven't met Oreo yet, this is Honey's calf. We'll go up and say hi to Oreo before we grab Honey and bring her down to the milk stanchion. Super smoky out here right now. You can probably see kind of the orange glow on my face from the smoke. So I'm not going to milk milkweed this morning. So this is the cow that I usually milk. She's one of my favorites, aren't you, sweetheart? She's a good cow. So we'll just get Patty out of the barn and bring him out and he'll drink up her milk this morning. Oh my goodness, look who Oreo has behind him. So are these two little piglets, I don't know why, but they think Honey is their mom. <laughs> They're constantly breaking out of the barn and coming down to hang out with Honey. You guys, you're not supposed to be down here. What the heck? <laughs> oh my goodness. Baby animals are just the cutest things. Mister, we need to get you to go back up this way though because your mama is feeling nervous. Let's go, let's go. Come on, come on. Come on little piggies, let's go. Let's go find mommy. Hi Thistle, how are you? How is that udder looking? So Thistle is bred. She is a heifer, so this is gonna be her first calf. And she's filling out nicely. Come on. Let's go. Come on, everybody. Let's go. There's your calf, honey. Come on. Go with mama. Come on, everybody. Bring her back to her baby now. She did really well. So we're not gonna be consuming the milk that we just milked because it still has a lot of colostrum in it. And oftentimes when a cow gets really engorged uh, by just the amount of milk they're producing, it actually causes blood vessels in their udder to burst and bleed into the milk. So you'll end up with some pink milk sometimes. It's not mastitis and it's fairly common in the first like week or so. So a cow has four quarters that she gives milk from. And if she develops a mastitis infection, she can just develop a mastitis infection in one of those quarters. So generally when you're testing for mastitis, you test each individual quarter. Because I use the milking machine and put all of the milk in there, I won't be able to know, I won't be able to know which quarter it is that she has mastitis if she does have mastitis but I will know that I'm going to need to test her milk when we milk her next time um, if there's if mastitis shows up in it so I'm just going to take a little bit of this milk up to the house and test it and the rest of it we will dump so I am going to just like I normally do run the hot soapy vinegar water through and then the hot water but once it comes up to the house I'm actually going to break it all down and sterilize the entire thing just because be on the safe side. We are going to be processing our meat birds probably next week. They could be done now but I like a pretty big carcass and we have enough food left over at this point. We can just feed them out for another week. I do have chicken processing videos over on my membership community, which I'm going to be opening up again for new members in August. So I'll let you know when. And also super exciting, uh, my cookbook is going to be available for um, ordering for the hardcover 
probably next week. And so if you wanna be notified when I have that available, sign up for my newsletter, which is down in the show notes below, because I'm going to be offering a discount to everybody that signs up for my newsletter. So like I said, it's just down in the show notes. You can just click on it. It'll take you to a landing page where you can put your email address in, and then you can get my newsletters when I send them out. I don't send out a ton of newsle newsletters, maybe one or two a month. Um, so you don't have to worry about me spamming your inbox. We have all kinds of fun stuff going on today. I'm gonna to be doing a bunch of harvesting down in the garden. And I don't know if we'll get around to processing everything that I harvest, but we're also going to do some pressure canning today. I am out of pressure canned beans. So I am going to show you guys how to pressure can beans. I know pressure canning is one of those things that kind of freaks people out and it certainly did when I first started pressure canning, but I'm really confident with it now and I can share with you everything that I've learned about it. I think I've been pressure canning for, I don't know, 10 years now or so. And I love the diversity of what you can actually can when you pressure can. Whereas water bath canning or steam bath canning, you can only can high acid foods. And with a pressure canner, you can can meat and beans and all kinds of things that you otherwise wouldn't be able to can. All right, my friends, we are back inside. And I did test honey's milk for mastitis. So I use the California mastitis test. This is a liquid, you use 2.4 milliliters to of this to 2.4 milliliters of milk. And the way that I like to do it is to use this white mug because it works really well for it. And I did this earlier, so I'm not gonna really be able to show you how it works, but you mix them together and then you kind of tip it slightly. And if it's gelled, and it's very obvious when it's gelled, then it means that they have mastitis. If it's just runny and liquid and there is no gelling, then they do not have mastitis. So there was a little bit of gelling in it, which indicates to me that she does have a mild case of mastitis. So my plan for treating that is I make something called Dynamint. It's a homemade um, <clears throat> recipe for a commercial brand that you can buy. And I'll put a link to where I get my recipe down in the show notes if you want to go and check that out. So I just put that on her udder a couple of times a day. And then I also make sure that I milk her out a whole bunch. I had an idea that she had did have a bit of mastitis because the back two teats, I don't know if you noticed this when I was washing her, but they were caked in mud and manure, which indicated to me that the calf was not drinking off of those two teats, that he was just drinking off the front two teats because they were nice and clean. And sure enough, it is the back um, her back teat on the left-hand side that has the mastitis infection in it. And so, I am just gonna treat that. And within probably a week, she will be good to go. I've had really good luck. I've been really lucky when it comes to mastitis infections with my cows. I think we've only had it maybe two or three times over the last, when did we get our first milk cow? Probably 12 years ago now. So I, um, I feel pretty confident about being able to get on top of it without having to use pharmaceutical antibiotics. <clears throat> I have no problem with using antibiotics with my animals when it's needed, but I like to try to avoid them where I can. I'm just gonna go give my hands a good wash just since I just touched that cup that has the mastitis bacteria in it. And since I'm gonna be handling food, well, for any reason, you should always wash your hands after you're touching anything where you know there's bacteria, of course. So I'm just gonna wash my hands. Okay, let's talk pressure canning beans. This is one of the easiest things to pressure can and one of the things that I recommend people pressure can as their first product because it is just so easy. So my preferred method of pressure canning beans is to soak my beans and I have four big bowls of beans over here that I just put on when we came into the house earlier and these will be soaking until tomorrow morning and then I will be canning these up. Because I did not soak my beans last night in preparation for this video, I have done the quick soak method over here which is to put my dry beans in a pot and boil them for one hour. Rinse them off really well and then I'm gonna can them up. So the reason that I personally prefer doing the soaking method 
opposed to the dry canning methods, because I'm sure if you've been doing any research on this, you have seen people dry, use, just put dry beans in a jar, fill it up with water and can it that way. I have multiple reasons why this is my preferred method. The first reason is, is that beans contain something called raffinose, which is a carbohydrate that's really hard for our bodies to break down. And one of the factors in what causes gas when you eat beans. So the more that you soak your beans and rinse your beans, the less of that carbohydrate is, or it's broken down in a different kind of way to make it a little bit easier to digest. So the way that I like to do it is I soak my beans for 24 hours, then I rinse them. Then I put those beans into some water and I boil them for 30 minutes and then I rinse them again. So they're getting a double rinse and then I use fresh water when I put the beans in my jar. The other thing that I do is I add a little bit of vinegar to my soaking water. I don't know for sure that this really does make a difference, but I have heard that it also helps to make beans more digestible. One of the other reasons that I like to pre-soak my beans besides the uh, making them more digestible is because when you can with dry beans, they sink down to the bottom of your jar. And then when you put them in the canner and they start to expand, I find that they kind of wedge into the jar much more so than they do when they're soaked and they've already expanded to their full size. And it makes them a little bit more of a pain to come out of the jar. And I also find that the jar is harder to wash. Um, that's just a personal preference for me. And the other reason is just a lot easier to gauge how many beans to put into the jar when they're already expanded to their full size. So those are the reasons why I prefer this method of canning beans. I totally understand why people like to do the dry method just because it is a lot less work, but I find overall this makes a better product. So we have our beans over here that have been cooking for an hour. So now I'm just going to take these off the stove and strain them and give them an extra rinse for good measure. And just so I don't make a mess all over my counter, I'll stick my strainer back into the pot I was using and put it back on the stove. When you are canning beans, because they are a low acid food, you do need to use a pressure canner to can them. And I am using an all American 21 quart pressure canner. I'll show you how to use this in a second. We have our beans over here and I have my wash jars and my lids over here. Aren't beans just so beautiful? So I'm gonna be doing some kidney beans tomorrow, some navy beans, and I think I'm going to try my hand at making a canned pork and bean, some chickpeas for making hummus, and some black beans. I am right out of beans right now, so which is why I'm doing such a large amount of them. So now that we have our beans soaked, our pressure canner ready. There's two inches of water in the bottom of my pressure canner along with a splash of vinegar and that just helps the jars not develop that white scaly hard water staining on it, the adding the vinegar. Just make sure that you don't add too much vinegar because you will start corroding your rings if you do that. So we're gonna bring our jars over here and I'm doing seven quarts. My canner fits seven quarts and I did measure out my beans here and um, I did a cup and a half of beans per quart. So we have our funnel here. I'm going to grab a larger ladle to make the work a little bit faster. And then into the bottom of these, I'm going to add a good size teaspoon of pickling salt. This is not necessary. It just, gives them a little bit more flavor. I am filling my jar just to the shoulder, so just to where the jar is, starts to curve over with the beans, and then I'm going to fill it up with water just until it is just at the top right here, which is around an inch of headspace. So I've mentioned this many times before, but headspace refers to the space between the top of your product and the lid itself. And it is at a requirement for a proper seal. So don't cut corners with your head spacing. So for quart jars, I have to pressure can these for an hour and 30 minutes for my 
elevation. So make sure that you double check your elevation and that's at 10 pounds of pressure. I gauged this just about perfectly. So I'm gonna start my canner heating up. So we're gonna to want to debubble, and that just gets rid of any of the air pockets that have formed inside of our jar. So even though we don't have anything sticky in this jar, oh, it's still a good idea to wash the rim of your jar off, and this is a really good example as to why. So I just ran my finger around this with the cloth, and I felt this tiny little nick. Can you see that tiny little crack in that jar? So that will affect my seal. So I'm actually going to dump this out into a new jar and dispose of this one because that is not a good thing. I always get asked whenever I show canning videos whether I boil my lids to soften the seal. I do not find that a necessary step because this is going into a hot canner and that will soften the seal just like that. So now we're going to put our rings on. And remember, we're just doing those finger tight. Don't wanna wedge them on there too much so that the air can escape from the jar if it needs to. So now we're going to put these into our canner. So the lid of an All-American has a little arrow and a little spot there. So you want to line up those two, like so. So just like if you were putting lug nuts on a tire, you wanna go across from each other to put these on so that everything gets held down evenly across the canner. And you definitely want to go around and make sure that these are nice and snug. So now we are going to wait until we see air venting out of this little vent pipe right here. And once we can see steam coming out of there, we're going to set the timer for 10 minutes and that will allow our counter to vent. Once it's set for 10 minutes, we will put our weight on and I'll show you that when we get to that point. And we will wait until our pressure comes up to 10 pounds of pressure, which you can see here on the dial. And it's at that point, we'll actually set our timer. Pressure canning is one of those things that really uh, freaks people out. And it has a lot to do with all of the stories that we all grew up hearing of pressure canners exploding. One of the things to keep in mind is that the pressure canners of old were nothing like the construction of the pressure canners that we have nowadays that are also monitored by a lot of regulations, safety regulations. And as long as you are following the steps correctly, pressure canning is very safe. I do have a couple of guides, like mini ebook type guides, and I think they're only around $4 a piece over in my store. And I'll put a link for those down in the show notes. I have a canning troubleshooting guide, a water bath and steam canning guide, and a pressure canning guide over there if you want even more information or if you're somebody who likes to have something tangible that you can read. You'll get the download there and then you can just print it off on your computer at home. This is what a pressure canning weight looks like, at least for the All-American, and on it it has 5, 10, and 15. And you're going to want to put it on whatever pounds of pressure you are going for. So in the, this case, I'm going for 10, so I'm gonna put it on that one once it's had a chance to vent for 10 minutes. Okay, so we have venting action happening there. Can you see the steam coming up? So I am gonna set my timer for 10 minutes. So once I have the pressure canner set and the, temp the time is set for an hour and a half, we are going to go outside and do some harvesting out in the garden. I don't wanna to spend too much time outside because it is incredibly smoky. I just looked out the window and it does look like there's a breeze coming, <clears throat> excuse me, that's blowing some of the smoke away, which is good because my throat, I feel like I have a cold, like sore throat. I'm sure a lot of you can relate because I know it's been a really smoky summer for a lot of people. So this next step is probably the one that requires the most bravery. Let me show you. So see all that steam coming out of there so vigorously? You actually need to take your weight and place it on top of that. So the best advice I can give you is to just commit to it because 
it isn't that hard. <laughs> it does seem kind of scary at first, but it's not that hard. So now what we're gonna do is wait until our pressure comes up and it's coming up really quickly to 10 pounds of pressure. Just about there. There we go. So now we're gonna set our timer for 90 minutes. And the minute that this starts to wobble a little bit, you'll see that happening in just a second. I'm going to turn my temperature down. So what I'm waiting for here is this. So you can see how that's wobbling. So that's telling me that I can adjust my temperature. I turn it down to medium low. And what you want is this little wobbling vibration to be happening a few times every minute. So how it's going constantly like this, this is telling me that my canner is too hot. You can see my pressure is going up here. So that's why I've adjusted my temperature. This slows down to, like I said, it's just vibrating like that a couple of times a minute, then I know that my temperature is good and I can leave my canner. I have been pressure canning for a long time and I feel very comfortable to leave my pressure canner unattended for short periods of time while I go do clean the bathroom or run out to the garden like we're gonna do in a few minutes. But if you are new to pressure canning, I would suggest staying close to your pressure canner until you get to know it. Because each, each pressure canner, although they're manufactured the same, um, because you're using different, a different stove than they might have done in their test kitchens or I am doing here, the temperature that you need to have it set at in order to maintain the right temperature and pressure in your pressure canner is going to be different. So that just takes a little bit of time to figure out. So there we go. Now my canner has calmed down a little bit. So we'll just hang out here and make sure that it doesn't drop down too low. So here's the thing with pressure canning. If your pressure goes down below the recommended pressure for the product that you're canning, you have to actually restart your temperature or restart your timer. You need your pressure to come back up to whatever pounds of pressure it's supposed to be at and then start your timer at that point. And that's really important and that's kind of the part that you need to play with a little bit until you get to know your pressure canner co stove combination really, really well. Okay, we have that all set now. I'm just gonna grab my Rue apron and a pair of scissors if I can find them. Scissors are one of those things that are constantly going missing in my house. I don't know if your house is like that, but, and I'm just as bad of a culprit as my kids are for that because I am always taking scissors outside and then leaving them outside. <sighs> my garden. <laughs> oh, it makes me so happy. This flower bed. I have to show it in every video because I love it so much. It's so beautiful, but just makes me happy. Looking a little bit thirsty though. I'm gonna have to give it some water. And then over in this bed over here, the snapdragons along this side, look at those happy bumblebees are really coming on and they're so gorgeous. One of my favorite things about snapdragons is the fact that the bumblebees love them, but also because there's so many different beautiful colors. Like, look at that, spectacular. And I love the multicolored ones like this peach and yellow, burgundy, pale pink, just stunning. My beautiful herb bed. Do you guys remember I showed this to you just a couple of days ago and the sweet alyssum, which I started from seed in the early spring, it was just little teeny tiny, has kind of taken over the bed. <laughs> it is choking out my lavender back here. Look at this poor little lavender choked out behind this gorgeous sweet alyssum, which smells incredible. Some of the larger herbs like this one the um, sage and the parsley. The parsley is something we're gonna actually harvest today. Along with the beautiful German chamomile are fine because they're big enough to come up over the top of the sweet alyssum. But these little tiny lavender, I'm not sure what I'm gonna do. I might end up moving them. Oh look, straw flower, so pretty. So we've got a dark pink one. I thought these were all the same, but there's a light peachy pink over here. Okay, I'm just gonna grab the hose over here. So deadheading snapdragons is recommended and that'll keep you having blooms. 
Do you guys remember when I put these out here? I put them out really early and they're quite frost hardy. And they're way further along, weeks further along of the ones that I waited to put out. So next year, I'll put them all out earlier. Look at how huge this giant marigold is. It's probably three feet tall. The um, herb bed, most of the plants in this herb bed don't require a ton of water. They're actually really um, drought tolerant. <laughs> That's the word I'm looking for, including the straw flowers. So just going to water the parsley and I'll leave the rest to dry out just a little. We're having some great gardening weather right now because it's blazing hot, but um, raining intermittently. So we've had, we had some good rain yesterday and rain about three days ago, which is fantastic. I'm happy with this one. So these are all of the wave petunias that I started from seed back, when was that now? March, the beginning of March. And they were really tiny and quite pathetic when I stuck them in this uh, wheelbarrow here. But they're starting to do their thing and spread out. Look beautiful. So I'm always very ruthless when I harvest herbs and I cut them pretty much right down to the ground a couple times throughout the summer. And I tend to get really good harvests doing it that way. Okay, so here's what we have. This is what I've left in here for the parsley. So we still have leaves left, but I've cut off a ton of it. This beautiful plant right here is Russian tarragon. Isn't that lovely? So I think I'll do some of this as well. I don't use a ton of tarragon, but it's one of my favorites, favorite herbs to use with chicken. Now we'll take a wander over to the broccoli. Broccoli and cauliflower are one of those things that this time of year when they're really starting to come on, I need to harvest every day. So what I'm gonna check for here is if things are starting to loosen and this one definitely is. So you can see how it's starting to loosen a little bit. So definitely wanna pull this one off. That one can go for another day. Oh my goodness, I feel like I'm pregnant. <laughs> In a couple of days, I will get my wheelbarrow out and we'll do a huge harvest on all of this broccoli together. Normally I plant my broccoli all at the same time so that I can harvest it all at once because it's just one of those things that's easier to do in a big bulk amount like that, at least it is for me. But this year was not that year. This year I ended up with several different staggered plantings. Like this little one right here isn't even heading up yet. So that one's not gonna be ready for another four weeks or so, I imagine. Cauliflower, do you have some little cauliflowers here? Well, they're pretty tiny. They are starting to split open already. So we'll grab these little guys. Um, I think I have to go up to the house and dump this load off. And next time I come down, I'll bring a big bin with me that I can empty this out as I go because I didn't expect to fill it up so fast today. I wanted to do a ton of kale, but I think what I'll do is get all of these herbs put into the freeze dryer. And then when these are done, cause they don't take very long actually. I think it was 12 hours last time, maybe 15 hours. So I'll put them in now and then they'll be good to go tomorrow morning and then I'll fill the dehydrator up with all the kale. I wanna do a ton of freeze dried kale for adding to soup, stew, smoothies, whatever I wanna get some extra greens in in the winter time. So I can't believe all of that fit in to this little <laughs> apron. So we're gonna head back outside and get some more. We have some raspberries starting to ripen. Ooh, that one's pickable. Mm -mm -mm. 
we have a wild raspberry patch in the back of our north field that one of my sons came in yesterday and said is just loaded with raspberries. So we're gonna probably go pick those in the next few days too. Let's check the cauliflower down here. That one looks beautiful, but I'm gonna give it another day because I would prefer to do one big harvest of these, like I was just saying, than a bunch of smaller ones. That guy's still looking good. It's gonna be a good cauliflower year, which honestly surprises me. Oh, by the way, I'm just covering them up so that they don't get sun bleached. Oh shoot, I missed that one, look starting to split apart. So that one we'll grab. And the one beside it. I didn't even see these guys when I was out here earlier. That's just a little one, but also needed to be picked. Everything is coming on this year at a different rate than I'm used to because often I will have pickling cucumbers and cauliflower come up at the same time. And I love using cauliflower in my sweet pickle mix. But this year, we're probably still a week away before we're gonna get a decent crop of pickling cucumbers. So I guess I'll be freeze drying a lot of this cauliflower. Oh my gosh, look. So remember I told you that I planted a rainbow mix of poppies down the middle of my carrot patch. The first one just bloomed and there's this gorgeous pink one down here. Isn't that beautiful? It didn't germinate that well, but there's still enough that it should look pretty when it's done. I'm gonna have to check the weather forecast and if we're not gonna get rain, these are starting to look like they are needing a little bit of rain. So happy with the way the onions are coming along. So <laughs> my pouch is almost full again. So let's see if there's anything else that desperately needs to be harvested over here. Cabbages still have some time that they can stay in the garden. I planted a whole bunch of different kinds of cabbages this year. Some early ones, some winter cabbage, so that we can have cabbage. We love cabbage, so that we can have cabbage all year long. So I think that's it for harvesting off the main garden. Let's go check the high tunnel and see what we have in there. Lots of questions about the high tunnel. So I'm just gonna quickly give you some basic information about our high tunnel. It is a 60 by 21, I think, high tunnel. And, and we situated it so that the front and back door were oriented to the prevailing winds. So normally our prevailing winds come out of the south or the southeast. So that's this side here. And that actually helps to keep the high tunnel very cool in the daytime, much cooler with the shade cloth on the top than it is out here right now. Um, so I don't have to have any fans or anything like that to keep it cool in there. I also have roll up sides, which I didn't roll up this morning because it was so cloudy and smoky and overcast, but I will now. These roll up sides we got from Goodwin's Greenhouses here in British Columbia. and they help a ton. And then we just installed drip irrigation, which I highly recommend if you can, into the high tunnel, which has helped a ton with um, making sure that the, they, it stays evenly moist in here. So remember last time we came in, how we couldn't get in right here. So I have started doing some trellising and pruning on the first little section of the high tunnel but I still have a lot of work to do. Oh, it's so much cooler in here, oh my gosh. As you can see, falling over tomatoes. I was away for most of the month of June, off and on, and my high tunnel just turned into a jungle. That just might be the way it is this year. Hopefully within the next week or so I can get on top of it, but I've kind of let go of it. If I can't, I can't, and it's just gonna be what it's gonna be. Fortunately, we don't have a ton of, to of tomato diseases here in our area, so I don't have to worry about blight. Which oh my goodness, check this out. We have peppers. So my peppers have been dismal this year. It's been so cold at night, even though it's been blazing hot during the day, that the peppers just, 
haven't done a heck of a lot, but they are starting to, this is a candy cane pepper, isn't that gorgeous? One of my favorite peppers, but you can't win them all. And I think it's gonna be a really good year for all my brassicas, like my um, cabbages, my broccoli, my cauliflower, my kale, um, Brussels sprouts, all of those I think are gonna do really, really well. So if it's not a great pepper year, that's all right. So do you remember, I think it was maybe five days ago, maybe, yeah, something like that. I cut the basil right down and harvested all of that and freeze dried all that basil. And this is how much it's grown just since then. So basil is one of those things that you can cut back and it'll come again. It is starting to want to flower, as you can see there, but I think I can probably get away with another good harvest off of this anyway. I had some pickling cucumbers last time we were here three days ago, two days ago, <laughs> that were um, ready. So let's just grab those and we can just snack on those on the way up to the house because there won't be enough to actually do anything with. There's the little one, another one. Finally starting to grow. These guys like heat. And last year I kept them in under a row cover didn't do that this year, which is a mistake. Uh, but I still think we're gonna get a good crop because like I said, it looks like it's gonna be hot for the next few weeks. And if there's one thing that cucumbers love, it is heat. <sighs> Zucchini is starting to come on slowly but surely. I make the most delicious zucchini relish. And I don't think I've actually ever shown the whole entire process on my channel before. Maybe even if I did, it was probably a few years ago now. So as soon as we have zucchini, I will be sure to share it with you because it is everybody's favorite. Time to go back inside. Okay, my friends, we have all of the herbs prepared and they look just beautiful. I'll bring you down here so that you can see. We have the beautiful parsley, four trays of parsley, sage, oregano. This is actually oregano that I picked the other day that is pretty much dry just from sitting on the counter, but I'll run that through the freeze dryer to get every last bit of moisture out of it and all of the tarragon. So I have one tray left over there. I did buy an extra set of trays for my freeze dryer just for this reason, so that I could pre-freeze, have four trays pre-frozen in the freezer as the other ones are cycling through. And then as soon as the freeze dryer is available again, I can load it up and just keep rotating through that way. Um, with herbs in general, you don't have to freeze uh, pre-freeze them just because they're pretty, um, or they're lacking a lot of extra moisture, so they freeze dry really quickly. But since I had all of these, I will throw the extra four into the freezer. I do have a fourth one that is not full, but I have plenty more herbs in the garden that I can go pick a little bit later so that I have a full freeze dryer load to go in. Um, the canner is now done. So, so once your canner is done, so all your hour and a half for the quart jars for beans has finished, you turn your heat off and just leave your canner alone until it comes back down to zero. And then you can remove your weight. Be careful because this is cooled down substantially enough. I can touch this with my hand, but this will be hot. So use a glove. And the benefit of just taking that off is any of the extra steam that might be left in your canner will steam and vent out of there. So I'm gonna need both hands for this. So now we're going to uh, un do our lid. So there we go, our seven quarts of canned kidney beans. So uh, one of the questions you might be asking is whether pre-cooking and pre-soaking like this makes them soggy or mushy, I guess <laughs> that would be the right word. And in my experience, it doesn't at all. These are perfect to add into chili, which is primarily what I use the kidney beans for. I use the black beans for making rice and bean wraps, the chickpeas for making hummus, the navy beans for making pork and beans. Um, the black beans can be a little bit mushy just because they're a smaller bean, but the processing time is the same no matter what bean you're using. Um, but because I'm using these for rice and bean wraps or things where they'll all be mashing them up anyway, it doesn't matter. The chickpeas hold up their texture beautifully. I have not done the pork and beans before with these uh, as far as pre-can or canning them first. So I'm not sure about that. I'll report back, but definitely in my next video, I will share that with you. I think I might even get to that a little bit later on today. So I'll be filming probably wearing the same clothes in my next video, but I really want to bring you along with me for that. I'm hoping to film just about everything that I can 
throughout the summer this year. And then we will culminate the canning season with a pantry tour. I'm super excited to share that with you. I will do a pantry tour probably in the next week or so because our pantry is definitely at its lowest stocks um, than it ever is throughout the year. And you can just see compared to when it was fully stocked in November when we did our pantry tour, you can see how much we've actually consumed in that period of time. So I'm excited about that. I'm excited about the whole idea of bringing you along with the entire kind of seasonal journey of our property. So you've been with us now since we planted all of our seeds. Well, some of you guys have been here for years and years, which I deeply appreciate. But um, for this year, we started planting, the, planting all of our seeds in February and March and April, and then got the garden planted out. And now we're starting to harvest and process all that food. And then come the end of the harvesting season at the end of October, we will have our full pantry and we'll take you on that pantry tour. And then we will spend the winter months cooking all of the food that we have stored together all summer long. And I just love that whole idea so much. So what I did with the broccoli and cauliflower is I just broke it up into smaller pieces and have it sitting in a sink of water. And because some of this cauliflower is not looking so great, I definitely waited too long to harvest it. I think I'm probably just going to cut these up. I'll blanch them and I'll talk about blanching in just a sec and freeze this and we will use this up um, really soon, like within the next couple of weeks or so. I actually don't like storing things like broccoli and cauliflower in the fridge. I'd much rather just prepare it now and put it in the freezer, even if I'm planning on eating it within a week or so, just because I find that for these kinds of vegetables, when they sit in the fridge, they start to get just an off flavor. So that's the plan with those. The purpose behind blanching is it alters the enzymes in whatever vegetable it is that you're freezing. So oftentimes if you take like broccoli and cauliflower, for instance, and you just throw it right into the freezer, the enzymes in it cause it to have a, um, like a tough, a really tough texture, even when you cook it again, and it also loses color and it affects the flavor. If you blanch it first, it alters those enzymes. I'm not sure the exact science behind all of it, but it alters them enough that that doesn't happen. And for blanching, you just boil for two to three minutes, depending on the product that you're blanching and then dunk it straight into some really cold uh, water or ice water. That's a step I often skip <laughs> and I often just lay them out on cookie trays and throw them right into the freezer. But it is better if you get them cooled down right away so they don't keep cooking and become mushy. I put them on cookie trays or harvest rate tray if I'm going to freeze dry them um, and then flash freeze them in the freezer and then put them into Ziploc bags if I'm planning on freezing them or pop them into the freeze dryer. And that's what I'm planning on doing with a lot of my broccoli and cauliflower this year is freeze drying it. Um, just because I'm really short on freezer space this year. And then, yeah, just put it in Ziploc bags, suck all the air out, pop those in the freezer. The benefit of, you can just throw it right in your Ziploc bag. That's fine, especially if you're doing portion size bags. But if you're planning on taking some out, and putting it back in the freezer again, then I would recommend doing the flash freezing on a cookie tray method because it makes all of the pieces um, come apart and not freeze into one giant clump. All right, my friends, that is it for me today. If you have any questions for me regarding canning, either pressure canning, steam canning, or water bath canning, do put those in the comment section. I do try to read all of your comments and I will try to include your questions in an upcoming video because like I said, I'm planning on sharing lots of canning with you over the summer. I hope you have a fantastic day and I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye.